Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome uh, back again to our Wednesday night Bible study here. Seems like we were gone for a long time, three weeks it's been. So I hope you never forgotten uh, what we've been talking about. If you have forgotten and, uh, and, and you're new and you haven't been following us with the commands of Christ here, uh, I invite you to go to uh, my website or the church's website. You can pull off the, uh, the different PowerPoint slides if you want those, or you can just watch it in video form. Uh, so all the previous 36 commands are there. And the purpose of our study here is uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, uh, I'd served 25 years in the Marine Corps, and I've been a Christian for about 37 years now. And as I was looking through how we train Marines to go into combat, we have really have a progressive program. This is really a progressive program if you're going to be a firefighter, if you're going to be a police officer, or in most trades there's a progressive teaching program to get you from A to Z or to teach you a skill so you're actually proficient at it. But then in the body of Christ, I noticed, especially when I retired from the Marine Corps, as I look more closely at it, uh, when a person first becomes a Christian, we really don't have any training programs for them whatsoever. We give them a Bible, we tell them to go home and read it and, and expect for them to understand it and then to apply what they see. So uh, when I came across this verse, uh, prior to coming across this verse, uh, I looked in many different ways. I even went to a theological seminary to try to understand how you make disciples, how you teach people to follow Christ, how you give them that uh, Marine Corps type training where they can actually go into a hazardous situation and actually know what to do and do it uh, spontaneously. And so I still didn't, after four years, there's actually five years, I still didn't get the answer. And when I came across this verse where Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. It's like, okay, I know that's what we're supposed to do, but how do you do that? He says, first of all, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then the answer that I've been looking for for many years was right there in front of me all the time. It said, teach them to observe all the things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you even to the end of the age. Amen. And so Jesus is telling us the way we make disciples is once a person becomes a believer, we baptize them, and then we teach them to obey all the things that Christ commands us. And he wasn't talking about the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament. He was talking about the things that Jesus commanded us. So a careful study of the, uh, the four different Gospels, I learned that there's about 49 general commands that Jesus taught his first disciples. And when Jesus said to his disciples, really, if you love me, the way to demonstrate that you love me is to keep my commands. And so, but if you don't know what those commands are to the point where you can understand them and apply them, then you really can't obey that command. You really can't love Christ. You really can't love God the way that he wants to be loved. So again, a careful study of the, of the four Gospels, and there's, there's some that kind of combine a little bit, but there's pretty much 49 commands that Christ gave his disciples. And so our intent here on our Wednesday night Bible study is to look at each one of these commands one at a time so that we can truly understand what each command means, and then we also can apply these commands to our life. Tonight we're going to look at the command, bring in the poor. I've also learned that interesting that with each of these commands, there's also a corresponding character quality of Christ. These are different character qualities that Christ had and demonstrated when he lived on this earth. Like, for example, humility, meekness, joyfulness, generosity, love. But these are, these are character qualities that we cannot just instill in our life. We cannot just say to ourselves, T I'm going to learn to be humble more this year. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. But as we learned the command of Christ, for example, the first one was to repent. As we learned what that meant, which really means to be repenting, and as we are repenting, that takes humility to do that. So as we obey that command, the character quality of humility becomes instilled in our life. Christ squeezes out in our life what is no good, and he puts his character within us, which is uh, humility. And so... I've also learned that even though we don't have these characters within our own life, that God miraculously puts these characters in nature. And if we carefully look at the different animals in nature, we can see that these characters are innate, or they're part of what an animal does uh, without having to be trained. It's just who God has made them to be. And so from time to time, I, give you, uh, I have an opportunity to give you a demonstration of what that looks like, and tonight I'm going to do that also. And so the, what I want to show you tonight is through the bighorn sheep relating to our command tonight, which is the bringing the poor, how God has used the bighorn sheep to demonstrate one of the characteristics of hospitality in nature so you can see what that looks like. One of the definitions of hospitality is providing a peaceful environment. Makes sense. If you, even if you, at the 
at the level where if you brought people into your house, you really want to have a peaceful environment. So I want to show you how the bighorn sheep does that and how it's na uh, natural within its own environment. A little bit of background on the bighorn sheep to help you get an understanding of how God designed these creatures. This is its habitat, so we pretty much don't have them here in Southern California, but we don't have to go very far to see the bighorn sheep. Now the bighorn sheep, they live to about usually around 10, but they can live up to 15 years old. They'd be 15 years old. They weigh between 150 and 300 pounds, and the women would probably like this characteristics of them. The, the men are usually about 100 pounds more than the women themselves. Now their horns, of course, being a big horn sheep, that makes them pretty impressive, so I wanted to give you some facts about their horns. The horns are about 30 pounds in themselves. They're massive horns. The horns are predominantly used for either uh, protecting themselves, fighting other animals, or you can see the way that they're shaped in the front. They can actually use them for digging, pulling out roots and stuff like that. The rings on the thing itself actually show you what the age is, and if I can see if I can pull up my little highlighter here. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but say from here to here, you can't see that ring probably at the distance you are. Maybe you can. And then you can see another ring here. So that's two years. And there's another ring there. It goes at that level. That's three years. And there's one up here. That's four years. And so the rings, almost like on a tree, tells you how old the animal is. And of course, as he gets older, the rings are smaller. It grows more when he's young. The horns are also used for uh, confrontation to determine who's going to be the leader of the herd, and although it looks like these guys are going to kiss, they're not. They're going to butt heads. And so, like other creatures, they, the men just seem to want to butt heads over who's going to be the leader. And uh, they do that until they get completely dizzy, or their blood comes out of their nose and their eyes, and just a strange way of saying who's going to be the leader. The one that is dizziest and walks away is the loser. Now, another interesting thing about the bighorn sheep is that both the, men, the male and the females have horns. And so they both have horns. Now, the feet itself is probably one of the things that interests me the most, and I wouldn't think it would be. The feet of any animal is, seems to be nasty to me. But as you can see, this feet here on the bighorn sheep, it, it's shaped kind of like a hoof. But what was interesting to me I, as I was studying this, I found out that the, uh, that the sheep, as, as you know, if you've seen them in nature or in different television shows or on documentaries like National Geographic, how they can climb up and down cliffs, amazing power, strength. If we try to especially in the Marine Corps, I used to try to do some cliff climbing up and down. It's a lot of work, very difficult. But these animals almost do it effortlessly, climbing up and down, jumping up and down. But what I found is this is two of their feet side to side. If you take four of, the, of this bighorn sheep's feet, it can actually fit each four just a slightly on the edge of a penny. That's all it needs to balance itself on the side of a cliff. So it finds any little crevice or outcropping from the, from the cliff, the size of a penny or bigger, it could actually stand on that cliff balancing itself. Pretty amazing. And so this is a little bit picture here how it stands on the cliffs. And so you can see as it drops down the cliff, even at the weight of 300 pounds, if there's a little outcropping of a rock the size of a penny, it could actually stand on that with confidence. Of course, we, we can't do that. And so that what makes it effortlessly, it almost effortlessly seems to like free fall down the side of a cliff, but it's not. It's catching on to each one of these little outcroppings. And also back in their shoe, you can see it miraculously the way that their hoof is designed, it actually acts like a brake also. They're just like a, like a brake on a car. They can actually squeeze their hoofs together and stop like a shock absorber going up through their body and stop themselves. Now, when they have young, they normally have one. At times, they will have twins, but normally they just have one, one little baby there. And what the mama uh, does is she actually licks her baby when it's born, completely licks this thing, like not just cleans it a little bit. She completely licks it every square inch of its body, all the way from its nose, all the way down to its tail. And actually, it's, that term is, is called owning. And as you probably might have heard that term before that people use, oh, he owned you, he owned you. It means he completely dominated you. Well, that's where it comes from, really, the, the bighorn sheep. And when that, what that does is she puts her scent on that animal from top to bottom. And when that animal can only go to mom, her mom, to get milk, if she went to any other goat, they would reject her. So the mom has to smell that smelling on her baby in order for that baby to be accepted by the mom. Of course, there's not many predators of the, of the bighorn because they can uh, run up and down the side of the cliffs like no other animal can. But one of their biggest predators is the, is the uh, mountain lion. 
And of course, you know who their greatest predator is. Of course, the greatest predator of any creature today is man, because they uh, they weigh about they can weigh up to 300 pounds, and there's a lot of meat. And some of them just like to to put their horns up in their wall somewhere. So their biggest predator, of course, is man. Now, I want to show you some things how this uh, animal distribute uh, displays the characteristics of hospitality in its life. One of the things that the bighorn sheep does, it actually creates a safe environment that actually attracts other bighorns to its herd, so to speak. And so one bighorn will actually map out the side of a cliff, map out an area, know where the feeding is, know where the water is, know where predatory animals can attack them from, and actually knows every area so if something would happen, they can run from cliff to cliff, they can lead themselves and others to different places to make it completely safe for whoever chooses to become part of that herd. And so when other uh, animals, usually between 5 and 15 different goats, when they see that characteristic in a person, it's actually an inviting quality to them. It invites them, in a sense, to join that herd. And so a single binghorn by itself really has the ability to create a safe and a peaceful environment. And as a result, this attracts other people to that environment. And the corresponding character that we're going to see in our life, that I believe that the Lord wants us to have in our life, similar to the bighorn, is that as Christians, this command that we're going to see tonight, bring in the poor, Jesus teaches us not to avoid the poor, the poor people, but to actually create an environment in our life where poor people feel safe when they come to us. We become a person where people come to us, and we, we, we're an inviting type person for people that are poor, not a person that would run away from the homeless people or run away from people who are in need, or people that if a homeless person or someone in need would see us, they would automatically feel like we're going to shun them. We would be more like the bighorn sheep, and we actually would be a person that creates an environment that we actually accept them, and we're there to help them. And so before we get started on looking at Christ's command, bringing the poor, let's pray. And so, Lord, as we come to your commands again, Lord, after this short break, I pray, Lord, again, that we, could go, in a sense, go back in time. And as you taught your first disciples, Lord, these commands, and as you captured them in your scriptures, Lord, tonight we may hear them, and may we completely understand, may you help us to understand all of us, each one of us, in a ways that we can understand what this command means, and, Lord, more importantly, how to apply it in our lives. And so, Lord, I thank you ahead of time what you're going to show us in this command. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so this command comes from Luke 14, starting in verse 1. It says, One Sabbath day when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched, and there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, he says, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and he sent him away. And then he asked them, if one of you has a son or an ox and he falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And again, they said nothing. And when he noticed how the guests had picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. He said, when someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, before more, uh, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have also been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and he will say to you, this man, give this man your seat. And then humiliated, you will have to take the lesser seat. But when you're invited, take the lower seat. And when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better seat. And then you will be honored in the presence of your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will, will be exalted. And then turning to the host, he said, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, and your relatives, or your rich neighbors. And if you do, that they may invite you back, so then you will be repaid for what you've done. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and then you will be blessed. And although they cannot repay you back, you will be repaid back at the resurrection of the righteous. And so we're going to look at this, and this is where we're going to get the command, bring in the poor. And so the first thing we see is this says, one Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. Now, the more and more we go through these commands, you may have noticed that the Pharisees seem to pop up all over the place. And well, interesting, I found that almost one-third of all the verses in the Gospels pertain to something that the Pharisees are doing, or Jesus is correcting the Pharisees in one way or another. And that's because false teachers have really been around with us ever since Satan lied to Eve in the Garden of Eden. 
These people can be very successful in how they mislead people. And there's still many of these false teachers that exist today. When we studied the command, beware of false prophets, we briefly looked at Jim Jones and what he called the People's Temple Christian Church. And just give you an example of how these people exist today and how uh, dangerous they can be, similar to the Pharisees. I'm going to give you a review of what we talked about then. And in 1977, the majority of the members that were part of Jim Jones's church, they, were come, they came from Christian homes. The senior pastor, Jim Jones, he was a man that really knew how to inspire the people, and they loved him. He was committed to the people that were in need in his community. He counseled prisoners, and he counseled those that were juvenile delinquents. He started job placement centers. He opened rest homes for, and also homes for people that were retarded. He had a health care clinic. He organized a vocational training center. He provided free legal aid. He founded a community center and even preached about God in his church. He actually gained admiration and the praise of church leaders in his area, the governors, senators, congressmen, and even the president of the United States at the time. So this wasn't somebody that somebody would obviously instantly appear to be a false teacher. He actually was somebody that people followed and people praised. But something just made him move to South America. Actually, he wanted to move to South America to escape all the materialism in the world, so he actually moved his church to South America. But shortly after they were there, complaints from family and friends uh, of abuse down there prompted the congressman, Leo Ryan, to actually fly to South America to investigate what was going on down there. But while he was in there in 1978, as Congressman Ryan was leaving, uh, going back to his plane, he was shot and is killed, and so was several members of his party. Shortly after that, Jim Jones forced his entire congregation to drink a Kool-Aid-like drink that contained poison, and it was women and children first, and you can see some of the families here. And those that refused to drink this concoction, they were, sh they were shot or they were forced to drink it. And within a few hours, over 900 members of his congregation were dead. Now, Jonestown really is one of the most visual examples of how dangerous false prophets can be. And today, you know, not all fa false prophets outright go out and kill their members. However, all false prophets are dangerous because they all really lead people to the same end, destruction. Like the Pharisees, Jim Jones, he was a religious leader. The Pharisees are religious leaders. And people expect their religious leaders to lead them to heaven, not to hell. And so what I want to give you is a really a brief history of the Pharisees since I never realized how many commands they were involved in, how many times Jesus talked about them, about one-third of the Gospels pertain to the Pharisees. So I want to kind of give you a little snapshot of who these Pharisees are so you have an idea where they came from, what they'd done, and really were, and how they fizzled out. First of all, the Pharisees, they were really a positive group at, at front. They did not start off as false prophets, as false teachers, and I imagine... I don't know for sure, but maybe perhaps other false teachers and false prophets that even exist today, they never started out having that intention of misleading people. Matter of fact, the word Pharisee itself means this a separate, separated one. And you know the church, Ecclesiastes, or uh, uh, Ecclesia, which is the church, means separated ones, us that are separated from, from the world and, and separated unto God. And so their name itself was a good name. But when Antiochus Epiphanes sacrificed the pig on a Jewish altar, this forced the Jewish priest, and he also forced the Jewish priest at the time to eat it. And some records say he actually caused them, uh, he choked them to death with this pig being shoved down their throats. This started what was called the Seven Year Maccabean Revolt in Greece around the year 168 BC. And you may know that the, the Jewish festival that is called Hanukkah really is a celebration of the end of that revolt, and it really was a celebration of rededicating the temple, which uh, Epiphanes sacrificed the pig on. But about 150 years before that happened, the Greeks tried to do what's called Hellenize the Jews. Now, Hellenization is a process to try to make all the Jews like the Greek-type people, to change their entire culture, to get rid of all the Jewish culture, all the Jewish tradition, all the oral law, all the talk about Moses and all that stuff, and completely create a, a culture of, of the Greeks. But there was a group of devout men, devout Jews at the time, 
And their purpose was really to preserve the Jewish culture and to preserve the Mosaic law. And these people were called the Pharisees, and that's where the Pharisees came from. You know, when the Jews were taken into captivity into Babylon, when they came back out of captivity from Babylon, Ezra actually made copies of the, of the books of the Bible that they had, the scriptures that they had, and he began to teach the people. But shortly after, the Pharisees, for some reason, they assembled and they began rewriting the scriptures. I say for some reason, really the reason was because it was too difficult to obey the scriptures and do all the things that God was commanding them to do. So they decided to get together and look at every scripture, and the ones that were too hard to obey, they would simply rewrite them in a way where they could obey them and turn them into traditions. And so they started rewriting all the scriptures and reinterpreting them, and it almost entirely replaced the scriptures in themselves. The scriptures that they were writing were really traditions. They were uh, collections of Jewish interpretations. And by the Middle Ages, or what we call the Dark Ages sometimes, the, almost the entire Word of God was replaced with these different sayings or traditions. Now, during the time of Jesus, there was about 6,000 Pharisees on the earth. And some of them were, were good men, like Nicodemus, as you may know from the Bible. Not all of them were... Uh, covetousness, self-righteous, and, and hypocrites, but the majority of them were. And this is where we got the word hypocrites. They were called hypocrites many times. And the word hypocrite itself means an actor, a faker. It was really what they called, a, a Greek actor was called a hypocrite. And now the other major religion of this time, there was a couple, there was a few of them, about three or four of them, but these were the two major ones, the Pharisees, and the second one was the Sadducees. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, they did not get along at all. But you'll see in the scriptures, they only get along when they're against Jesus. But for the most part, they didn't get along at all. They had almost completely different views of everything in the scripture. For example, the Sadducees uh, welcomed the Hellenistic society. They welcomed the, uh, the Greek cultures. The Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection of the dead, as the Pharisees did believe in a resurrection of the dead. And you'll see how that's important and, and what, how Jesus teaches them a parable today. The Sadducees were actually the upper class. These people were the rich. They were the ruling priests. This is where the high priests also came from. But they received their riches from, we've talked about this before, is turning the temple into a marketplace. Their money came from robbing the people, really, and they were very rich. And so when the temple in Jerusalem and all of Jerusalem actually fell in AD 70 by Emperor uh, Titus, the Sadducees pretty much disappeared out of history because now there was no temple marketplace anymore. There was no way for them to earn their living and become rich. And so in history, the Sadducees, for the most part, disappeared. Now, Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70 by Emperor Titus. He took over 100,000 people captive, and he killed over 1 million Jews at that time. And so without the temple being there, without Jerusalem really being there, all of the Jewish religion began to quade, uh, fade very quickly. And so what the Pharisees decided to do is they took a collection of these Jewish writings and they compiled them in 20, 200 A.D. into this book called the Mishnah. It really was a collection of all their different writings. And today we see that the Mishnah and all the commentaries that were written about the Mishnah were combined together as what we call the Tamul today. It really is a, about 6,200 pages which outlines Judaism as even as we know it today. It contains many of the teachings and opinions of thousands of different rabbis in almost every different subject in a Jewish language. And so today when you hear the word historical Judaism, it really is synonymous with the word Phariseeism. It's the same thing. Jesus really summed up all of what the Pharisees did in Matthew 23, starting in 29, when he said this. He said, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of the religious law and you, Sar and you Pharisees? Pharisees, <laughs> you hypocrites. For you build tombs for your prophets that your ancestors have killed, and you decorate the monuments of the godly people that your ancestors destroyed. And then you say, if we lived in the days of our ancestors, we would have never killed the prophets. But in saying that, you actually are testifying against yourself that you indeed are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. And so with that background of really who the Sadducees are, the, the Pharisees are for our, uh, today, we start off again where it says, one day, when Jesus went to eat in one of the prominent houses of one of these Pharisees, there's a Pharisee there, they were carefully watching Jesus. Now, a prominent Jew at this time, a prominent Pharisee, would never invite Jesus into their house. They would only invite other prominent Pharisees or, or other people that they thought were prominent. 
But we will shortly see that this whole society at this time, it was really based on, I will do something for you if you can do something for me. The Pharisees weren't really didn't invite Jesus into their home to honor Jesus or to even recognize Jesus in any way. Their whole purpose was to trip Jesus up, to trick him. It was now on a Sabbath. It wasn't like he was out in the market anymore. Now Jesus was in the house, close quarters of all the other Pharisees, all the other, uh, what this, the text says, experts in the law, which were the Pharisee lawyers, and they were watching Jesus very closely because they had a little trick for him, something to trip him up, and they all can say, see, this man breaks the law and he's not of God whatsoever. Now, of course, this was just a simple meal after synagogue, like we would say we go out to lunch after church. And so what they did, as soon as Jesus got in there, before they had the meal or anything, it says there in front of him, there in front of Jesus, there was a man suffering with dropsy. Now this man was prearranged like Jesus to be there because they never would have invited somebody there. And I believe this may be a woman, but I didn't have a picture of a man. But this is what dropsy looks like. Dropsy really isn't a disease in itself. Dropsy is actually the symptom of a disease that causes the person to be bloated. Their heart bloats, their kidneys bloat, all their organs in their body bloat. Your heart can actually fail from this. Your face bloats, your, your, everything in your body bloats. The Pharisees actually believed that this particular uh, dropsy was caused from a sexual sin that a person must have been committing in their life. And therefore, the reason they had this dropsy, because it was a punishment from God. And of course, if anybody even would have healed this, it would have been against God. And of course, if they would have done it on the Sabbath day, then, then it would have been against the law. On another Sabbath day, you may recall, in Luke 6, there was all, they, they tried the same thing, but this time they did it outside. They did it outside the temple. There was a man brought to Jesus with a withered hand, and there's a man with a withered hand there. They brought him to Jesus to see if he would heal on the Sabbath, and of course, you know, Jesus did heal the man on the Sabbath. So this time they wanted to bring Jesus into the house, close quarters, so the Pharisees and the religious experts of the law could see Jesus up close on what he was going to do on the Sabbath. Now, the Jewish traditions, which were created by the Pharisees, are, are, is what said that you cannot go to a doctor on the Sabbath day. It was against the law for you to go to the doctor on the Sabbath day. And of course, you know that's ridiculous. There's no such thing like that in the Bible anywhere. But as I was reading this, what was really odd when I was looking at this, at least odd for me, is really what the, the, what the Pharisees were doing is they were putting this man in front of Jesus, and they were essentially saying, go ahead, do a miracle right in front of us, to prove to us that you're not from God. Almost silly to me. And so Jesus asked them a question. He simply said to the Pharisees and the experts in the law, he says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day or not? But they remained silent. Jesus knew what their answer would be. He knew they would say it's unlawful to heal, heal on the Sabbath day. And see, the lawyers did not answer. It says that they, they were silent. And I believe the reason that they did not answer is because if they did answer and told Jesus, no, it's not lawful, don't do it, perhaps Jesus would not have done it. So they didn't answer at all because they wanted Jesus to do it. They wanted to set him up. And so what Jesus did, he simply says, it says, so taking hold of the man, Jesus healed him and sent him away. Now it's very interesting, the words in Greek that it's used there that Jesus took hold of the man. He didn't simply touch the man. I can picture it thinking that this man has dropsy. He's bloated, a sense, with water in his organs. It's, the words in Greek really means he took this man and he, like, squeezed him. He gave him, like, a bear hug. Literally, like, squeezed this disease right out of him. Squeezed his organs back into health and his body back into health. He fixed everything that was wrong and he made this man whole. And then it says Jesus sent him away. Jesus knew that this man was not invited by the Pharisees. He was not a friend of the Pharisees. And he really was gracious in just say, having the man leave. It would have been horrible for the man to have to stay and to encounter the rest of the ridicule from those Pharisees, but he simply sent him away. But before the Pharisees could even speak, before they can say anything, before they can even accuse him, the Bible says, he says, if any one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? See, wells were everywhere in Jerusalem, and there's a well there where the little donkey was. And people walking around at night, the best of the time, they would just fall into the wells. Now this man with dropsy, he was, he was essentially drowning in his own fluid. Interesting analogy why Jesus used the well. So this is what Jesus was telling him. 
He says, what if your son falls into a well on the Sabbath day? Or what if this man that I just healed from dropsy was your son? Your law says that you should just leave your son into the well. Your law says that I should not have healed this man. But what if it was your son in the well? Would you leave him there overnight, even if it was the Sabbath? Which one of you here would do that to your own son? And again, the Bible says they had nothing to say. And again, I think they had nothing to say because if any of them would have admitted and said something like, I would have left my son in the well overnight, the others would have looked at him like, no, you wouldn't. You're a liar. That's crazy. You wouldn't do something like that. And oxen and cattle were very valuable to the Pharisees. That's how they had a lot of their livelihood and moved a lot of their supplies, so they were valuable. And all of them knew that none of them would have left their ox overnight in a well, either be stolen or it would die, or it certainly would not leave their son. At this point, Jesus had called all of them hypocrites, and none of them had anything to say because it was obvious that they were. And Jesus could have just left their house and went on in his day, but he didn't. He stayed there. Because what he wanted to do, he wanted to show them mercy. Although he had encountered these Pharisees over and over and over again, he yet takes another opportunity. It's appointed unto man to die once and then the judgment. But they weren't dead yet, and Jesus was giving them yet another opportunity to show them how to get into the kingdom of God. He wanted to show them really how senseless their traditions were in light of God's word. And so when Jesus noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. Again, I've told you before, parable is when you bring something that you know in, in this parable. It's they know what the places of honor were at the dinner table. They all know what that is and compare it with something that they don't know. And what they did not know is how to enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus is going to give them a parable based on something that they know and show them something that they don't know. As they were watching Jesus, Jesus was watching them. He was watching how they all scrambled to sit in the places of honor. And you may or may not know this, and this is about as accurate depiction as I could find. The table in those days was typically set in the middle of the room. Around the table, the people were kind of like in a, in a U-shaped fashion. The host would actually sit in the very middle of the table. And then, of course, the guest of honor, ranking from the highest guest to the lowest guest, would sit on the left and the right of Jesus, or of the, of the host. And then it would go down on to the less, less all the way until you get to the least person, uh, less, least important seat in the entire room. And this isn't much different than setups how we have today. Here's a Department of Defense room, and it's not classified, by the way. <laughs> but this is the Department of Defense room, and they pretty much have the same setup. Now, you know that honor was a big thing for the Pharisees, so places of honor and who would sit in those places of honor was also a big thing for them. In Matthew 23, 5, it says, they, they do all their deeds, Jesus said. He, he called them on it. He said, they do all their deeds only to be noticed by men. So Jesus was observing this mad dash of people trying to jockey to the best positions. And so he told them this parable. He says, when you're invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has also been invited? The whole soul have to come to you and have to say, give up your seat to this person. And then you'll be embarrassed. And you will have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. And then when your host sees you, he will come and say to you, friend, we have a better place for you. You'll be honored in front of your guests when you move to that place. Now, see, Jesus doesn't really mock what they're doing. He doesn't point out and say, look, look what you people are doing right here and mock them. He doesn't want to mock them. He doesn't want to embarrass them anymore. Instead, he changes it. Instead of to what they're doing, he changes it to a wedding feast scenario to get their minds off of what's happening there so they don't become defensive that he's against them. He says, when you're at a wedding feast, a wedding feast really was the biggest and the most formal of all events at the time. And we know in the Bible, they didn't have revelation at this time, but we know the Bible tells us that there will also be another wedding feast that we, you and I are invited to, we're actually commanded to come to. And it was the biggest feast, the biggest time of all. So he uses that as his teaching point. And what Jesus was trying to teach them is that they needed to be humble. He was trying to teach them that if you want to get into the kingdom of God, you need to learn how to take the last place. You need to learn, you need to demonstrate your humility by taking the last place and not the first place. And then he tells them this, he goes, for those who exalt themselves 
they will be humbled. But those who humble themselves, they will be exalted. And so Jesus now turns to the host because he was initially talking to the other people who were scrambling for a position of honor, but the host already had a pre-assigned seat. But this was the, actually the Pharisee that invited him. So Jesus turns to this host now, and he says to, and he says to him, Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a lunch and our dinner, do not invite your friends. Now, our, our Bible say do not invite your friends because in their language it would have been written a little bit differently. So really what he was saying, and I'll read it to you the way that they would understand it, when you give a lunch and other dinner, do not only invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. And if you do, they may invite you back so that you will be repaid. And see, the Pharisees would only invite their friends. They would only invite their relatives, their rich neighbors to dinners. They would only invite them if they knew that their neighbor, their friend, their neighbor had the ability to reciprocate or to later invite them to dinner. If a person could not later invite them to dinner, they simply wouldn't be asked. The Pharisees lived in what they called a gift obligation type of a system. And this is similar to we live in this today, sadly. We, even believers, we live in this. Basically, we say, I'll invite you to dinner, but then later you need to invite me to dinner. Or I'll give you a gift, but I really expect to you to give me a gift back. And so this give to get system was really a system of selfishness. And Jesus was trying to point that out to them, that they really were selfish people. And then he shows them how to be truly blessed. He says, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and then you will be blessed, be blessed by God. And although these people cannot repay you, you will be repaid by God at the resurrection of the righteous. Again, Jesus knew that they believed in a resurrection. If you help someone who cannot pay you back, Jesus was telling them, then God will repay you back at the resurrection of the righteous. The Pharisees knew that there was two resurrections from the dead. There was a resurrection of the righteous, and there's the resurrection of the unrighteous. In John 5, 28, it, Jesus says this. He says, don't be surprised. Indeed, the time, he was coming, the time is coming when the dead in the graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. And those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life. And those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. So the resurrection of the righteous really is for those who humble themselves before God and they put their trust in the living God. The way to enter the kingdom of God was to give up your self-righteousness, your selfish traditions, and to humble yourself. That's what Jesus was teaching them. And again, he reminded them that whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. This is how he started, really, his ministry. We know in the, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, in Matthew 5, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit is a person who knows they have nothing to give God. They're poor. They have absolutely nothing they can give God in exchange for salvation, in exchange for heaven. God said those are the ones that are blessed. He says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. They mourn because they know that they're sinful. They know that they're wicked. We mourn because we know we have a wicked heart. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Those that hunger and thirst for righteousness really hunger for God. They hunger for God's forgiveness and for God's righteousness. And so, in application, through these parables that Jesus showing these people how they need to humble themselves, I want to show you how we get the command where Jesus tells us to bring in the poor. And how, this, how we can take from what Jesus said to understand this command and then to apply it. First of all, I want to give you a little perception of what per, of poverty is in America. This was written in 2012. And as a perception, it's not necessarily saying that this is true or false. This is just a perception that we have. And you'll see that some of it is true and some of it is not false, and, or some of it is false as it pertains to poor people. And the first one is that 49% of Americans believe that if you have a good work, work ethic, then you, you won't, you'll never be in poverty. That's what people believe. 47% of Americans, again, if you want to follow on your outlines, believe that if we gave the poor people more assistance, that they would just simply take advantage of it. 
And again, what Jesus is telling us to embrace the poor people, to be like the big horn, to set up an, an environment, an atmosphere, where when people see us and they encounter us, we're people that help them. We know how to help them. We're not deceived, and we'll get into that. We have discernment on who to help and not to help. But if these are our perceptions, that 49% are poor because they don't want to work, 47% would take advantage of anything I give them anyway, 43% of Americans, if they really wanted a job, they can get it. That's what people believe. As you, you may or may not know, as of this past Saturday, uh, a million more Americans are now low collecting unemployment insurance. And we'll, we'll look at that in a second. 29% of Americans believe that poor people have low, lower morals than other people have. And 27% of Americans believe that poor people are just lazy. That's why they're poor. And this is the perception that people have. If you use the word welfare today, it's certainly not a word that anybody would look at as a, as a positive word. But Jesus said it and wrote it in Proverbs 17.5. He said this. He said, those who mock the poor insult their maker. And those who rejoice in the misfortune of the poor, they will be punished. And so I'm going to show you some practical ways of how we can actually bring in the poor, how we can obey this command, which Jesus was showing the, the, the Pharisees there. For them, it was pretty much more on how to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But for us as believers, it's what to do with people that are what we would call poor and who these people are. The first way we can practice bringing in the poor is really to, sh to practice or to show hospitality. The word hospitality itself really means to meet a need. As we were, I think it was the fourth command, Jesus said, uh, let, let your light shine. And letting your light shine really is seeing something that needs to be done, a, a need that needs to be met, a basic need in the life of someone. It doesn't have to be necessarily food, clothing, shelter. It could be a hello, a hug, a friendship, seeing a basic need in a person's life and actually meeting that need. That's hospitality. In Hebrews 13, 1 to 3, it, it says this, keep on loving each other's, as brothers and sisters, don't forget to show hospitality. For some of you have even entertained angels without even realizing it. Remember those that are in prison as if you were there yourself, and remember those who are being mistreated as if you were being mistreated yourself. See, hospitality really is giving, is taking what God has given you and I and using it to demonstrate to other people that God exists and that God is real. The second way we can practice bringing in the poor is do it for Jesus. In Matthew 25, starting in 35, it says this. It says, Then the king will say to you and I and all those who believe in him on his right on that day, he will say, Come, you who are blessed by my father, and take your inheritance. What inheritance? The kingdom has been prepared for you since the creation of the world. For when I was hungry, you gave me something to drink, and I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And when I was a stranger, you invited me in. And when I needed clothes, you clothed me. And when I was sick, you looked after me. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. And then a righteous will answer him and said, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or when did we see you a stranger and invite you in? And when did we see you needing clothes and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? And then the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you do and whatever you did to the least of these brothers of mine, to the least of the people that I've created, you do it to me. You see, if Proverbs 19:17 says, if you help the poor, you really are, are lending to the Lord. And it says, he will repay you. The other way that we can, practical way to bring into the poor, is really to know who these poor are and then to help those that are in need. There's really four groups of poor people that need help. Four different groups of people that the Bible specifies and these people are who are what needs help. And we need to first know who they are. And even when in the church that we are in today, these people exist within our church, but often we don't even know who they are. So we need to take the time. We need to, as Jesus observed what was going on, we need to take the time to look around, not only in our church, but in our community, in our workspace, or wherever God brings us, so that we can see who these people are. The first one is, the fatherless. Psalms 10, 14 says, to, talking about God, it says, you are the helper of the fatherless. Many families today are fatherless. 
Many families in our church are fatherless. More and more, as I look around church and, and I run the Saturday night children's ministry, I speak to the children and we do prayer and share, and many children don't have their fathers at home. Not that they're deployed, it's that their fathers are just simply gone. And so when we come alongside these children that are fatherless, it says, since God said he's the helper of the fatherless, when we help the fatherless, we essentially act on behalf of, of God when we help the people that are fatherless. We need to know who they are and that we need to come alongside them. The second group of people that need our help are the orphans and the widows. In 1 Timothy 5.3 it says this, it says, take care of any widow, which is an action word. Take care of any widow when no one else will care for her. If she doesn't have any children or grandchildren, which is their first responsibility to take care of her, if they don't have those, then we, you and I, are supposed to take care of the widows in our church, in our environments. And it says this is something that pleases God. James says in James 1, 27, he says, really what is pure and genuine in religion, you say you're religious, you're a religious person, R religion only has to do with these two things, really to visit the orphans and take care of the widows. That's what religion is in the Bible. That's all that it is. You keep yourself unstained from the world is the second part. The next group of people that need our help is what the Bible calls strangers. These are people that live amongst us that are from other countries that don't know our cultures. These people are often shunned or just ignored in our life. Exodus 23, 9 says, it says, you shall not ignore, harass your strangers. For you, you know the heart of a stranger, for you yourself were strangers in the land of Egypt. I believe as our mission pastor, Mike Pilato, there's a new ministry that's recently getting started because he's realizing even in San Diego County, there's thousands upon thousands and thousands of people that live in San Diego that are from other countries. And the Bible says, these people are strangers in our land and we need to find ways to help them. The last category of people, as you may imagine, that need our help are really what Jesus is specifically talking about is the poor people. Now, there's several categories of poor people, and this really, we need to have wisdom. And this is really the hardest part for, for you and I. This is where the rubber meets the road on how do you know whether it helps somebody? How do you know whether a homeless person you should give them money? How do you know where a person's not trying to con you? How do you know whether somebody in church hasn't got 20 bucks from you and 20 bucks from nine other different people? How do you know when you're going to be ripped off and what to do and what not to do? And sometimes that's what keeps people from helping. And so I want to kind of show you a little bit of that. But the bottom line is still going to take discernment. You're still going to have to ask God to help you to decide and determine uh, what category these people fall in. And ultimately, if you're wrong and you do the wrong thing and you help somebody, then it's probably better to help them than not at all. And so this is the first category of poor people that the Bible talks about, those who refuse to work. The Bible's pretty specific on that in 2 Thessalonians 3, starting in verse 10. It says, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we heard that there are some people who walk among you in a disorderly manner. They're not working at all. They're busybodies. They do nothing. But now those, this is what I want you to command those people, and this is what I want you to encourage them to do in the name of, of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to tell them to work. And then when they work, they, they'll, they can eat their bread. If they don't work, then don't feed them. They don't eat. And so how do you know whether a person is homeless? How do you know a person is not working just because they simply refuse to work? Again, that's going to be hard to determine but we really need to determine that. We, we, we need to engage a little bit to determine. And if you determine that they flat out tell you, I, I don't want to work, work. And I've heard people say this. Uh, people said this to my face. I don't want to work. I don't want to be a slave to anybody. You know, I'm free. And it's like, well, then you're free. The second group of people are, are those that are being, those that are actually being punished by God. Proverbs 6.26 6 says this. It says, For a prostitute will bring you poverty. Now, if people are engaged in prostitution, immoral living, other different types of crime, this isn't blessed by God, and God will allow that person to come to poverty so that they will repent. We're not supposed to help people in that category. We're not supposed to give people money to go visit a prostitute. 
We're not supposed to give people money to go get beers and to go buy cigarettes and to go waste that money or even to uh, help them commit a crime. But again, it takes discernment to understand that. Samson is really one of the prime examples in the Bible. Because of his actions, he lost his power, he lost his position, he lost his freedom, he lost his eyesight, and eventually he lost his life. He lost everything because he was punished by God for the way he was living. The prodigal son is another, another prime example. It says in Luke 15, 13, it says, he slept with the pigs. And it says in 15, 13, it says, he wasted all the money in wild living. God doesn't expect us to give money to people who are just wasting their money on wild living. They're being punished by God. And we don't want to contribute and keep them in the pig pen longer. The next category of people who are poor are those who are actually being tested by God. A prime example is Job in the Bible. It says in Job 1, 20, Job chapter 1, verse 20, starting in verse 20, it says, Then Job stood up and he tore his robe in grief. He shaved his head and he fell on the ground to worship. And he said, I came naked from my mother's womb and I will turn naked when I leave. He says, The Lord gave me all that I had and the Lord's taken away all that I have. And praise the name of the Lord. And all of this, it says, Job did not curse or he did not blame God. He was simply being tested by God. And then there's another category of people that are poor. Those who are poor for reasons that are beyond their control. And see, this is the category that Jesus is telling us, you and I, that when we come across these people in this category, that we need to do something about it. Again, how do you know whether they're refusing to work, they're being punished by God, they're being tested? We don't know. It takes discernment. But when we do decide they're in this category because they're poor from circumstances beyond their control, we need to help. Lazarus in the Bible is a prime example. It says in Luke 16, 19, it says, There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen, and he lived in luxury every day. And at his gate laid a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. And as Lazarus lay there, longing to escape the scabs and the pain, longing to get some of the scraps from the rich table's man's table, the dogs would come and lick his sores. And that parable, or maybe even a true story, the rich man never helped Lazarus. And really, if you think about what Jesus is telling us here, you and I are that rich man. You and I are the one that see people that we know that they're hurting, not because something that they've done. It's beyond their control, and we see it every day, and we do nothing. We are the rich people that see these things, and we simply choose not to do anything. One of the things we should also do is see the potential, potential in poor people. Again, we have poor people in our church. They're here. Some of them may even be here now. And oftentimes, if we know who, we, who they are, we shun them. We, we move away from them. We don't create an environment where they want to know us, knowing that we will help them, knowing that God has given us discernment to know when to help them or how to help them, not to support their habits, but to simply help them. There's ways that we can see the potential that are really in poor people and even in those that are disabled. In this one particular case, you may have heard of her, uh, She's probably not known to most of the younger people, but even though I'm not an old guy, I know about Fanny Crosby. When she was a baby, she screamed that the doctor put medicine in her eyes. Whether it was the wrong medicine or whatever it was, it didn't cure the infection. It actually made her blind, completely blind. But her mother taught her to see life through God's eyes, through the eyes of her creator. And when you hear songs like Blessed Assurance or 9,000 other some songs that she's written, it helps remind us that people like Fanny Crosby, all, although she was poor and she's disabled, she definitely has a lot of potential in God's eyes for doing good things. And Jesus, again, in all these commands, is the ultimate example on how to apply the command. Jesus was, was always a friend to the poor and the needy, really regardless of why. In Matthew 5:40, he says, I tell you the truth, whenever you did this to one of the least of the brothers of mine, the least of the people that I've created, you did it for me. And Jesus' heart attitude on all that he had is this. He was, he, if he could say it, it's not written in the scripture, but he would say, what's mine is yours, and you can have it. That needs to be our attitude towards poor people. Again, Jesus said, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, 
and you will be blessed. And although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So let's pray. And so, Lord, these, these words, and we see these words, and oftentimes I know, even myself, sometimes we want to do something, but we don't know how to do it. Lord, I pray that we would take time this week to contemplate these categories of people. And, Lord, I ask that you would give us discernment. But above all, help us not to be like the rich young ruler, rich young king. Although every one of us knows that there's poor people around us, there's people in need, there's fatherless, there's widows, there's orphans, and we do nothing. Lord, help us to do something. Give us a vision. Help us to come alongside those that are in prison, those that are in orphan uh, old age homes, and their need is everywhere, Lord. Help us to look at the ministries of our church, the ministries perhaps Pastor Pilato is involved in. But Lord, help us to do what you did when you came into this world, not to expand our own kingdom here on earth, but to expand your kingdom in heaven by coming along these people, knowing that they can repay us nothing, but looking forward to the time where we see you in heaven. Until then, Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.